Hello American History 2 students, it's Mr. Bell here with another review during the COVID-19 shutdown of 2020. Uh, this is day 6 of the shutdown, Monday, March 23rd, 2020. It's day 132 of 180 if we were in school uh, on a normal day, which none of these days seem normal. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're washing your hands, not shaking hands. Uh, if you can, stay home, stay home, and just try to... Uh, uh, let this country beat this virus the best they can because the more and more you stay isolated, as depressing as that sounds, the better it is as far as uh, getting over this and we can kind of get back to normal. Now I know things have not been normal lately. I miss you guys. I miss teaching. I love my family and it's cool being able to be here with my babies. But at the same time, uh, I hate the instruction that we're missing out and I just hate being around y'all and up there teaching. So uh, I know that this is kind of supplementing that a little, but nothing's like actually being up there and being able to take questions. I want to encourage you during these reviews, or as this review process winds down, and we may be getting to new material online in the coming weeks, if that's what the governor and Cleveland County Schools decide, then I encourage you to, while you can't comment on this YouTube uh, video because of the school restrictions, I hope that you will email me and interact, especially when you have questions about newer material, bsbell at clevelandcountyschools.org. But for now, uh, let's go ahead and get into the warm-up, and then we'll get into our review. So, what was the influence of sea power on history? And all these warm-up questions today have to do with books that we have studied uh, and their impact on history. The influence of sea power on history was written by Alfred T. Mahan. Uh, a naval guy for the United States military, and he went through all of the. Actually, I need, I think he may have actually been in Cong Congress after his uh, naval service. But anyway, you can Google that and check me on it if you want to. In fact, let's do it right now. I just want to double check myself. I could have. I think he may have done some stuff in Congress here. Let's see the beauty of the internet. Alfred Hitchcock, no. He's a naval officer. Was he ever in Congress, though? Looks like he wasn't, basing on a quick glance at this uh, Wikipedia page here. So, maybe I'm just thinking he testified in front of Congress. Anyway, he's the one who said that we need to have a strong Navy if we want to be the dominant world power. He went through all the dominant world powers of their time from, you know, the Spanish until the Armada was sank, going all the way back to the Romans. And for their time period within their scope of their leadership of a region, the dominant powers all possess the strongest Navy. And he says, if the United States wants to be the next dominant world power, they need to possess the strongest navy. We're unique because on the East Coast, we got the Atlantic Ocean. On the West Coast, we got the Pacific Ocean. It is an advantage because unlike Europe, we're not all clustered together to a bunch of other countries all around us. Uh, of course, we have Mexico below us and Canada above us. But for the most part, we're kind of isolated compared to uh, other nations. So... It makes a tricky challenge, too, because you got to be able to possess the Navy to use that inherent advantage of being surrounded by both the oceans. The Essence of the Frontier, uh, that's one of the essays written by Frederick Jackson Turner. More of an American one thing, but after we fa finish Manifest Destiny, then what we need to do is continue with the frontier. So what do you do? That means you spread overseas. New markets, new military bases, things of that nature. How the Other Half Lives was a book written by... Jacob Reese that showed the nastiness of immigrant uh, living. It was meant to insult immigrants, but while it did that and made a lot of money for people reading it kind of because they wanted to not poke fun at immigrants, but just see how miserable they were, it also opened up a lot of eyes. And we talked about during our immigration review, so I don't need to hit on that too hard. A Century of Dishonor was written by Helen Hunt Jackson. And what it did was it outlined all the travesties that we had orchestrated toward the Native Americans going back to Metacomics War all the way through things like Wounded Knee and the Sand Creek Massacre. So it was, a lot of people consider this to be to Indians what Uncle Tom's Cabin was to African Americans. Only one problem, there was already too much damage to come back from by the time that people really start to 
uh, wake up as far as what we had done toward Native Americans. So Century of Dishonor, while important, doesn't have as big of an impact as, say, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Shame of the Cities, uh, this was written by Lincoln Steffens. It dives into the corruption of people like William Boss Tweed, who rigged the system, and he did it in a way that he made it seem like he was doing good things for immigrants, but he was really doing things to line his pockets and run his criminal empire. We're going to talk, I think, either tomorrow or today during our review about that. The History of the Standard Oil Company, written by Ida Tarbell. Ida Tarbell was a muckraker. She's a writer who tries to expose the corruption of big business uh, during the Gilded Age, which we're about to get into, and she focuses here on Rockefeller. So let's go ahead and get into our review of big business. If you're following along in the notes, then you will be able to find this in 2.2. If you have your packet with you, that's awesome. Feel free to follow along here. So let's see what we got. If you remember this image, this is a very big political cartoon uh, from that time period. And uh, what makes it so powerful is we see Rockefeller here, who for a long time was the richest man in America. And you see D.C. drowning in oil. Of course, he's known for his oil company, the Standard Oil Company. And you see him holding uh, the White House in the palm of his hands. This is meant to illustrate the power that big business has over Washington, thus the power it has over us. So let's look at steel. Steel became a valuable commodity in the early 1900s because the skyscraper. Uh, you had built out in big cities about as much as you can, so you needed to build up. And with Elisha Otis's invention of the elevators we talked about last week during our review, uh, what you had was a need to build more skyscrapers because the demand was going up. They were more practical. So the Bessemer process made for a cheaper and more efficient way to make steel. What the Bessemer process allowed was a quicker cooling of steel. So what you had, <coughs> excuse me, what you had with the Bessemer process is you would have the liquid metal poured down into molds and it was blown using fans and then it cooled quicker with the right amount of air pressure put on to that. And you can look up more stuff on that if you're that interested in steel. Of course, Pittsburgh would be the steel capital of the United States, hence the name Pittsburgh Steelers from the NFL team. So this is a big thing as far as skyscrapers. So your two big kind of tycoons are Carnegie, which is steel, and of course you have Rockefeller, which is oil. So oil is first struck in America in Titusville, Pennsylvania. At first, it's valuable, but people don't realize how valuable because it's used for like kerosene lamps and it's used for lamps in like bigger cities. But before Henry Ford invents the Model T and automobiles become commonplace, it doesn't hold the value as it will, of course, being one of the most valuable commodities in the entire world. So more on that later because we're going to get into Rockefeller. We talk about the difference here between trust and monopolies. So let's start with monopolies. Monopolies is no competition. None whatsoever. You're the only one that provides a good or service to the public, so therefore you control the price of that good or service to a fault. If the only place you can go for shoes is Nike, then shoes would be very expensive, and they wouldn't have as much of a desire to put quality shoes out because where else are you going to go? The most the most common monopoly that's referenced, especially in recent history, is Microsoft before Apple had a resurgence with uh, the iOS and the iPhone and all that stuff with Steve Jobs. If you bought a computer, you had to have Windows to run an operating system. Now, if you go down to Best Buy and you buy an HP laptop, it comes with Microsoft Windows loaded on it. But back then, you had to buy the Windows operating system separate. And there was no really other operating system. There was Linux. There was some things here or there that really nerdy computer people could use and figure out. But for the common public, it was going to have to be Microsoft Windows. So something that's now included with a computer was about 200. And every two years, you had to get the latest update. So if we had Windows 95, by the time 1997 rolled around, you had to get Windows 97. Or, yeah, you just saw that. Mike just hit me in my 
my big nose there. But by the time that Windows 97 rolled around, you had to go out and get that or things would start slowing down. This is very comparable to you guys with your phones. If you don't get it, you can keep your iPhone as long as you want to. But if you don't get a new phone every two years, it seems like they start running really, really slow with the Galaxies and with the iPhones especially. So monopolies, we try to avoid those in the United States because we're a capitalist society. It's all about competition. Most people believe competition is better for the consumer because when companies compete, we get better products and we get better prices. Trust means limited competition. There's still competition, but maybe not quality competition per se. Now we have all these antitrust laws to prevent these types of things from happening. A recent attempt at a trust was AT&T and Verizon tried to merge. Congress blocked it because they would control all the uh, all the high quality towers throughout the United States, especially the internet towers, uh, things like 5G now more than half would have been controlled, I think it was like three quarters or something, would have been controlled by AT&T and Verizon if they would merge. Now, would that make them a monopoly if it was Verizon, AT&T? No. You could get Sprint, you could get Boost, you could get T-Mobile, whatever, but is it going to be the quality of that AT&T and Verizon? No, it's not. So then you're on the verge of monopoly, oftentimes with trust. So the goal of antitrust laws is to root monopolies out before they kind of become a thing. Excuse me. So, Andrew Carnegie, still tycoon. Carnegie uh, Homestead Steel was the name of his company. Of course, they'll have the big Homestead Steel strike there. Uh, Carnegie used vertical integration. That means only in all steps of production. We went over this in class. So, you have to be wealthy to be able to implement vertical integration. But if you do, it will save you more money in the long run. Thus, you will make more money in the long run. So say you wanted to build a skyscraper. Uh, you, would, you would buy out a lumber company, an electrical company, a lighting company, a glass company. So every skyscraper that you built, you would be using your product. We used, I think we used candy bar. We used candy in our example in class. So you wanted to make a candy bar like a Snickers. You could buy a peanut company, a caramel company, a nougat company, a plastic company, a cardboard company. You're spending a ton of money up front, but in the long run, it's going to save you and make you more money. The not still used today somewhat. What is not used because it creates trust and eventually monopolies is horizontal integration. It's how Rockefeller made his his fortune and became a, a multi-billionaire with the Standard Oil Company. So what did he do? As you hear my dog in the background. Come here, Penny. What, <laughs> what Rockefeller did was Anytime he saw that oil had been now he was he was rich he was he was born with money uh but anytime that oil would be discovered, he would try to in the United States he would travel there and he would offer the people more money than they could ever fathom having in their lives and he would be putting out hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars to buy off this land that had oil on it life changing money to those people uh sending them up sometimes for generations but I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but ultimately, costing them a chance at making a fortune in the long run because he would take that money that he invested hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars in buying their land and turn it into the multi billion dollar uh, standard oil company. So, horizontal integration is a lot easier to understand than vertical integration. Horizontal is buying out your competition. That leads to trust and leads to monopolies. So this happens sometimes. Um, this happened with professional wrestling in the 1990s. There used to be three big wrestling companies for my wrestling nerds. There was WCW, WWE, back then WWF and ECW. WWF ended up buying out WCW and ECW and the quality of wrestling went down. That's an example of horizontal integration. However, it wasn't technically a monopoly because there were these other smaller wrestling outlets like Impact and TNA Wrestling, Total Nonstop Action and things of that nature. 
So this is something you still see today, uh, but there's always that kind of wiggle room that prevents it from becoming a monopoly. So you could honestly call Rockefeller the father of the monopoly in, in the, as far as the business concept. Of course, not the board game. Ida Tarbell, she despised Rockefeller, and she detailed in the book A History of the Standard Oil Company all the people that he had swindled out of valuable land. Now, he was paying these people a lot of money when they found oil, but they had no idea what they were actually sitting on as far as a monetary value. And she goes and she details how these people's lives could have been changed so much more than the money that he gave them. Of course, he ended up reaping the rewards and his family, of course, so on and so on. Still one of the richest families in America, when who knows what happens to these people that originally struck oil. So Ida Tarbell was a muckraker. Muckrakers. Muck meaning dirt, mire, just icky stuff. Uh, and of course you know to rake means to drag through like dragon leaves through the yard. Muckrakers were writers who wrote in books, but they also had their own magazine. One of the first magazines in the United States was McClure's Magazine, and it was a group of editorials that sometimes newspapers wouldn't print that tried to dive into the corruption of people like Carnegie and people like Rockefeller and how they had hurt the little person on their way to the top and tried to expose this corruption for what it was. So that's McClure's Magazine, The Muckraker. Uh, Going to go through some of these other tycoons here. Cornelius Vanderbilt is the railroad tycoon. Uh, his home is Tennessee. Vanderbilt University named in his honor. The Commodore was his nickname. The Commodore State, sometimes as Tennessee is referred to. His son, of course, would go on to build the Biltmore House, uh, which many of you have probably been to in Asheville. And we talked about him in class and you know his lifestyle that was very interesting to discuss. Uh, he is known as one of the first philanthropists in the United States, people that have so much money they don't know what to do with. So they donate this money to charities, to churches, to help build schools, to help build hospitals, and to make things better uh, in their community. Vanderbilt, of all these people we're talking about, one of the actual best human beings out of the bunch. Now, he was a meticulous worker, didn't take a vacation until... Uh, he was he had been working, I think, 20-something years without a vacation. Finally goes on a vacation, and the guy who is his second in charge, because his son, who ended up building the Biltmore House, really wanted nothing to do with the business, Jay Gould tries to take over uh, his company while he's away. There's a lot more to it, and it's super complicated, but you're not going to be tested on it. We're just hitting the highlights here. But Jay Gould ends up trying to do a hostile take out, takeover of Vanderbilt Railroad, and uh, it breaks Cornelius Vanderbilt's heart. So J.P. Morgan, he started with GE, General Electric. They built the first fridges that were sold in homes, washers, dryers, household appliance. He becomes a millionaire off of that. He leaves GE, steps down, and he becomes somebody who works in finance. So J.P. Morgan is a financial tycoon. His J.P. Morgan's business now that has merged with Chase Credit Cards. J.P. Morgan and Chase, as you see that Charlotte Observer update. Uh, J.P. Morgan and Chase is a popular credit card company now, financial company now. What J.P. Morgan would do is he would go to people like Vanderbilt, like Rockefeller. I don't know if them specifically, but very wealthy people, and he would invest their money in stocks and bonds for them, and he would take a percentage of their profit, almost like what a stockbroker would do today. So think about it. You give him $500,000, he makes the right investment, he makes that a million dollars, and he takes a 25% profit. He's pocketing $250,000. If he has all these different clients who are millionaires and billionaires, it's making him a lot of money rather quick, and he builds his brand up, and he goes from a millionaire with GE to a billionaire with J.P. Morgan. Henry Ford, revolutionary because he not only created the first mass-produced car, the Model T, uh, but in Detroit, he came up with the idea of the assembly line or division of labor. 
Uh, you'd have a chassis department, a, a wheel department, a fabrication department, a glass department, that kind of thing, a safety department, and you'd work on the car little by little and it allowed you to make the product uh, rather quick rather than trying to just, say, build a car in a single room. Of course, Ford is synonymous with Detroit, still the head of Ford Motor Company. His great, great grandson, I think, at this point, owns the Detroit Lions, hence the name Ford Field, where they play. So he would also kind of came up with the idea of employee discounts. I want you to think about this. He would pay you five bucks a day, which was an honest living back then, nothing compared to what he was making. But for an average middle-class person, it was a decent living. And if you wanted one of his cars, he would give you a discount. So I want you to think about that for a second. He pays you money to build the car. You turn around, build the car, give him the money that he paid you, and you take the car that you helped make. Of course, this is still, whether you're working at McDonald's or you know Walmart or whatever, you are essentially, with an employee discount, when you buy something, giving back the corporation the money that they just gave you. Of course, I got to ride in the Model T. Uh, we talked about that in class. So, social Darwinism, if business doesn't adapt, it fails. We talked about how Blockbuster was the king of video rentals. They never adapted. They were just happy sitting on top. Uh, they never tried to do digital. They never tried to do anything like uh, the boxes to rent from. They did eventually, but it was too late. Redbox had already become synonymous with box renting. Uh, whereas something like taking, while Blockbuster didn't evolve and it died, Netflix is constantly evolving, right? You have the disc in the mail that becomes a streaming service, that becomes a streaming service that has other people's content to create and their own content, such as their own shows and eventually their own movies. So the best companies, they continue to adapt over time to survive and succeed. That's social Darwinism in the business world. Uh, big business and government, unfortunately, the two go hand in hand a lot of times, and our politicians sometimes make the decisions that's best for big business, such as corporate tax cuts, than they do what's best for the consumer. Uh, gospel of wealth, it creates the idea of philanthropy, that if you have extra money to give, like Cornelius Vanderbilt, you give that money to charity, to the community, and reinvest in it. So that's going to do it for this big business review. I hope this has helped you at least kind of refresh some of this stuff as we're still in this shutdown. I'll be back uh, with you tomorrow with some other type of review. We may try something different, may do like try to do a reading activity on here. And I'm not going to review all of Unit 2. I'm just kind of going to skip around. So I think I'm going to go past, like I'm not going to do 2.3, all the labor stuff. So probably the next thing I review as far as content will be the early civil rights Booker T and WEB. Remember, email me at bsbell at clevelandcountyschools.org. Any questions you have, and if there's anything you want me to answer on one of these videos in the future, any content that you're having a hard time maybe understanding, I encourage you to reach out to me. Uh, stay safe. Thank you for tuning in, and may the force be with you.